hello. Wait a second. We are going live now. Yes, here we are. Perfect. Hello, everyone. How are you? Welcome to this session of ECXO. By the way, you cannot see how many people are here all the time. That's a, a real problem that we have. Well, at least it's the two of us, isn't it? So that's already something. Yeah. Is it, it's only working the LinkedIn right now and, and YouTube, it's not working my Facebook and the, and the group of Fisiax on the Facebook. Let's start. Okay. Um, let me see. In the... So welcome everyone for this session for the ECXO executive sessions. Um, today we have a very uh, distinguished guest. Okay. And I'm going to introduce him in a few minutes from now. Uh, about first the ECXO. The ECXO objective, the ECX, actually, the ECXO is an open access uh, CX professional network that we are building around Europe and the world. The objective of ECXO is to unify 50 European countries and beyond, establishing a consistent level of CX maturity, addressing the diversity across Europe. We aim to British. CX maturity gaps while pre preserving cultural richness through educational research events and collaborative efforts with top organizations of all sizes. And today we have an amazing guest, Professor Jan Eric Barr, speaking about strategic design. And he is the author, and I actually come across him a few years ago. He wrote this amazing book here, the first book of its kind that is really business oriented for leaders. And I think is a great guide to guide a company through the design and customer centricity um, uh, path, to, uh, path that you have to take to engage your company and to, and to improve your company. So let me introduce you, Professor Young. Professor Yan is the current is currently the the head and of advanced studies program in design management at the University of Applied Materials Applied Sciences, excuse me, in Lucerne in Schweiz in Switzerland. We created so what he does. He created the Customer Centricity Score CCS, and is one author of the amazing book that I just mentioned for you. Um, he is also a member of the board at uh, a company called, uh, where is the company? Vetica. Swiss Design Agency Vetica and co-owner of the Cosmer Metric AG, a firm specialized in organizational metrics, which he is here today. And he has some many, many ideas about that that can work really well. So without further ado, I will leave you now with Professor Jan and I'm going to disappear, but I'll be here for your questions. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Ricardo, for having me in your session. Uh, hello, everybody. For those who are there, I uh, hope you you are inside, cozy and warm. Let's uh, let's guide you through like half an hour, maybe, through uh, my presentation on strategic design and why this is key to achieve uh, a sustainable business growth and customer growth. Um, well, I already. There's a lot of been said about me, so I think I can skip this. Uh, maybe one thing to mention um, for those that do not know me, I am a designer by heart. I was a trained industrial designer and worked for as a designer in at Philips for almost 20 years and also at Deutsche Telekom. So I'm I was been many for many years part of the development side of business, so to say, uh, engineering design. That was that is my background. So I don't have a real business I am background. A designer. Um, so 
let's jump into the presentation. So how do businesses become successful in the first place? I mean, that's something that you would always ask yourself and what also I did in, during my career. And clearly you have to provide something that businesses really need, isn't it? Something meaningful, uh, which again, more and more businesses are struggling to provide the sort of meaningful solution. But it alone, of course, it's not enough. Something that people really need. Uh, yeah, uh, most of the people have what they need. Um, so what, what beyond that you have to do is, of course, you have to provide something that people really want. A proposition, a solution which fits their pocket, their wallet size, their desires, their needs, uh, beyond uh, the fundamental. So really being becoming relevant for customers is, is the second thing you have to be able to achieve. And still, this would not be enough. Beyond that, of course, you also have to provide that what people really desire. Uh, so something that is kind of encompassing this service or product or proposition that you provide, giving it a, an emotional touch, uh, allowing it to differentiate uh, from other competitors, providing an identity, something that is very experiential. And these three things come together in what we call the experience economy, uh, where businesses increasingly are competing, not on, let's say, a functional or technical level, but they, they compete against each other on an experiential level. And the ability to create very differentiated and very relevant solutions is what, what will determine the success of an organization. So that means that for a lot of players out there, it's not any more competing with your nearest competitor that will define your success it's competing with other experiences uh, because consumers have been become aware of what's possible and uh, they create their world of experiences. So they set the bar themselves with regard to what they expect from a customer and how they want to yeah, relate, uh, interact and also use the services that they get. So there's a true shift happening here where organizations have to yeah, deal with. So in the end, it's the customer, of course, and always will be um, at the center of this decision making. It's the customer deciding on what they really value in the experiences that they get. Uh, so to recoup at the center, of course, is the user experience, the function, the, the, the fundament, uh, the core service of an organization, which is embedded in the relevance. Uh, so the, the customer experience, so to say, where you get a proposition made for yourself, which again, is embedded in a so-called brand experience, in an identity, something that is conveying the organization's values and image and and uh, yeah, and, and, and design as <laughs> from let's say the outer perspective and the, the value perspective. So if this comes together, we can see that customers really become excited about what they get. And beyond that, they they start to behave in a way that we really need to become successful and remain successful. They adopt a positive attitude. They start to recommend the organization. They start to engage with the organization, build retention, and um, yeah, and also are willing to spend maybe their whatever they have on the company, on the organization to support it. Yeah, so of <laughs> the, of course the Apple fanboys, but this corresponds to the customer fanboys. So apparently organizations that have certain success do this by understanding that the customer is at the center of everything they do and are also able to design an experience, a holistic experience that is throughout really um, providing consistency and coherency towards the customer. So in this skill, this, this uh, mastery, so to say, to do this, to be able to conceive and, and also render a holistic experience is what will set the, um, let's say the successful organizations apart from those that will lag and fall behind. Now, this means that you have to be capable in a certain way, isn't it? You have to be capable to create these coherent and consistent experiences towards customers and that you have to make sure that you align everything you do in your organizations so that the outcome is really representing this, this uh, coherency. And this is a true struggle in organizations. And maybe most of you 
know this inside out huh? because you are working in a in an apartment most likely in a function of an organization and this is how most of the organizations still are set up are designed are shaped in in let's say silos in functional departments and where for instance the, the r d function is focusing on usability on creating the core the core offer so to say and therefore is very much focused on creating satisfaction at the user what a marketing and sales department for instance could have a focus more on the consumer which not necessarily is a user yet and will set his goal on achieving customer retention so a different perspective and therefore not necessarily aligning in its effort to design a coherent customer experience and beyond that there might be a corporate department building a brand image uh, talking to the wider world uh, to create attention to the organization and building a brand experience so uniting these activities that all create outcome towards customers is what I call strategic design is where, where all the design efforts are connected and create something that is more than just the sum of its part. It's where the word gestalt, you know, the, the form giving really has this true meaning. It's uh, we see something in the togetherness of what an organization is creating that is more than just this individual part. And with that, we create true impact. And this, this effect counts for every business, uh, B2C, B2B. I mean, it doesn't really matter what you do. It's also applicable to every organization, the organization that I in, I'm in. Uh, if, if we talk to the wider world or just students, I mean, we also promise something and we have to deliver on it. And even, even in a larger scale in on societal level, this still holds. Um, it, it all, we're all looking for clarity, for uh, a cohesion and also a consistency in whatever we are doing. So it means that in in winning the customer to become yeah supporting your organization, um, you are you have to to be to be capable, isn't it? It's it's, it's in this saying um, yeah, that what comes around goes around, or in the German it's even nicer. Yeah? So wie man in den Wald ruft zu schaltes heraus. Um, always sounds nice if you say it <laughs> in the German language as well. But actually, it means that and any organization gets the, the customer it deserves or it creates. Uh, if the organization is uncoordinated and not motivated, customers also will be uncoordinated and not motivated. So there's a direct relationship between the organization's ability and the customer's, let's say, reaction to it. So organizational potential is determining the customer potential and thereby has a direct input or influence on how much value between these two parties can uh, emerge can can be created so that means that we have to look into organizational capability and and, and also understand what that is and also try to uncover the status of organizational ability to understand in how far we, with that potential, can create custom experiences that are truly exciting. Uh, and with that, can create customer potential in the form of loyalty or spending uh, willingness or um, recommendation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which in the end will yield a customer value. So it's really about us, the organization's capability that counts. And we need measures and methods to look into the organization and to find out, okay, how good is the organization in, in creating a truly outstanding customer experience? So how do we get there? How do we, how do we build an organization that's more capable than it, than it was before in order to create these experiences? Well, first of all, the organization has to want this, isn't it? It's like, you know, uh, you buy a racing bike and you say, okay, let's go across the Alps. I mean, nice you can buy a tool but um, you also have to be able be fit enough to do it so you have to adopt a certain mindset an excellency mindset and this means is that you are able to address both of the two dominant issues that you have in your business both at the same time and so on the one hand you have to address all the burning management issues specifically these days and obtaining and maintaining the resources controlling your business setting yourself apart from competition, growing efficiency, uh, and with that securing 
uh, your business from, from that perspective. But at the same time, you also have to master all the design issues that you might have. Uh, creating the relevant propositions, for instance, being differentiating to your competitors, creating an effect, and also shape your future of the organization. So designing the future of your organization. These things come together and both all of the known yeah, business models are describing this togetherness in the sense that they call these the primary and secondary activity of any business, according to Porter in this case. Now, the primary activity being the one of creating the value for the customer, and then the supporting activity being the one of administer and manage the organization so that it has all the means necessary and needed in order to fulfill the primary activity. So it's a really a balancing act that organizations have to play and bringing together design and management. Uh, not separate, but together equally developed on a high level so that in, in combination they can create effect and efficiency at the same time. Uh, because this is uh, yeah, a crucial for, for an organization's capability. Now, if, we, if we're honest and we look around, or basically if we record the last 20 years, for instance, we can see that most businesses are very well capable of managing and administering their business. I mean, this is what has been taught at business schools. Most of the CEOs that I know have a business background. Uh, they, um, uh, they're business people, lawyers, uh, finance experts, whatever. So that's not really the issue, isn't it? It's more that the required high level of design capability in the broader sense even is not on an equal level. Uh, it's, it's because management is so dominating in an organization, also setting the, the mindset. The design is yeah, captured, provided, but controlled, minimized, reduced, <laughs> most, most likely being treated very efficiently and therefore not equally developed, not on an equally high level and therefore also not yeah, setting and dominating uh, like management, the mindset of an organization. So in most of the organizations these days, we have a, a controlling, let's say, bias. And this is interesting to observe, and maybe you also do this yourself. Uh, so in, in, as I said before, also in, in the view of Porter, an optimum is a balance between the powers that are at play in an organization, but also a, a good balance, a well-developed balance of the capabilities in an organization so that you have management and design capabilities very well developed um, and being present at all times. But there is this some sort of a pendulum that might swing back and forth, left and right in this case. Um, yeah, making an organization um, uh, dominating one over the other. And as I said before, in, in my observation in organizations and even in our society today, we are uh, in the management uh, in the management area, so to say. This means that we're very focused on efficiency. We are very focused on controlling what we do, but also we cultivate a mindset that is fueled with doubt. Uh, it's basically the mindset that you adopt if you truly are in that area. Whereas the mindset that you need in order to create, to develop, to design, to, um, to create something new or change is the one that you where you act out of trust isn't it you you need a freedom for it you need uh, a focus on eff effect rather than efficiency and uh, and that's what is is needed in organizations to create these outstanding very yeah uh, refreshing new relevant solutions so how can we get that pendulum more towards the middle so that both of these competencies competencies that are needed are are not eliminating each other but are equally developed because if you maintain a management view uh, and you, you're acting out of doubt, you are not trusting that much. So it means that you are reducing your time horizons and you become very, very short-sighted, short-focused. You end up by overlooking a quarter. So you get the quarter figures. And the only thing that you will see contributing to your value is the efficiency that you can create. So that's why it's so difficult for managers to, um, yeah, to, or designers to break into this because they will always be 
you know, outplayed by the call for even more efficiency because that's what's driving value creation. But if you have a leader at play, somebody that is also acting out of trust eh, because it's confident that you, he or she can do things, then you'll see the horizons getting bigger and more and more effectiveness comes in. And then you will see that the effectiveness will create the value. The top line will grow your business. So for me, it's all about building a competent organizations and I, where design and managing are equally developed. And I want to dive into to this with you to show you how can we develop management on this level so that we get a leading organization rather than a controlling organization. Good. So let's start with uh, diving into that. How can we build a strong design leadership? How can we achieve strategic design in an organization? So not just only, you know, the... Uh, the painting up or the, the, the beautification, but really true strategic design. There's three things you have to do in order to achieve this. First of all, you have to really bring together the silos, as I mentioned, as a design for a holistic experience. And in that, you have to empower the identity creation. I will come back to that. Then you have to provide clear roles and leadership. And so to make sure that these people involved in design can collaborate well, and you have to grow overall design maturity. Um, coming back on the overall view on design, as, as I mentioned, uh, what we do, what the organization can do is what customers experience, isn't it? So it's, it's crucial that we start there it, with the notion that organizational capability is driving customer uh, reaction, so to say. It's a bit of this idea of this backstage, front stage phenomena, where the capability of the backstage determines how good front stage really can be and on top of that of course it needs the right show so to say the experience that is really captivating but without this fundament of an operating system and so and a, and a managed well well managed organization it will never happen and we also have to understand that what the customer then experiences is likewise very multifaceted it's not only the user experience or the customer experience it's also the brand experience it's attractiveness and reputation floating around. It's a relevancy and the innovativeness on the customer experience level, but it's also on the user experience level, uh, the, the quality and the sensibility of what people really get from an organization. So all these things come together and can be measured and can be captured in order to give an indication to the organization whether they achieve a holistic design. In Lucerne, we created the so-called impact score uh, but there are many other scores also available that, that allow to understand what customers really feel and here i really strongly always yeah uh, make an argument for for capturing the customer voice beyond uh, nps because that's too short-fetched also customer satisfaction is uh, too much in uh, a rear view mirror approach rather do something where you can combine the various levels of customer um, impact uh, so where you have one that is really looking into functionality, which is a more of a satisfaction review, one that's more looking in, in the felt or perceived individuality, which is more, uh, yeah, a, a, an inquiry whether you are relevant. And then very crucial, uh, create a, an understanding in how far you create emotional impact at your customer, which is more related to NPS or maybe brand impact measurements, etc. And this will allow you, your organization, to get an understanding how capable the organizations are to, to have a customer that really feels engaged, eh? whether the customer only feels a, a compulsory um, uh, relationship or whether the customer might be satisfied or even, hopefully, is truly engaged with your organization. Um, the field study on this instrument that we did in Switzerland recently, um, last end of last year, so it's just a year ago, showed that customers overall, and this has been confirmed uh, this week also by a study in Germany by, the, by KPMG, the customers are very critical these days. They don't feel any impact. And so you can see here that the scores, which are in line with the NPS scores, uh, so from minus 100 to plus 100, the scores are all very negative. So customers, yeah, you have to really do something as an organization to create impact at the customer. And there's one other thing that we can see and learn from this data is that creation, creating emotional impact is the most difficult of all. 
Uh, the average score across these companies, 20 in total we measured, is minus 39. So it's a, it's a and it's more than 20 percent points lower than the average score for functionality. So it is really difficult to create emotional impact. And overall, in general, uh, customers are critical towards what they hear from customers. And this is, uh, this is something that we can notice everywhere. Huh? The emotion seems to disappear from our business. Um, the world is dominating maybe also by more functional issues, by fear issues. So people don't see it and they don't feel it, and, but they're looking for it. And they go to companies where they get it, isn't it? There are companies that still can deliver an emotional setting in a customer experience where customers are invited to increasingly relate with the organization, where even in functional environments, emotional aspects can be introduced to create a more, let's say, um, yeah, engaging effect. So we do know this, specifically as customer experience people, we know this, that, that organizations can do this and it should be done. And this is a reflection of the capability in organizations to put this customer at the center of everything they, they do. And also here, it is helpful to understand how well is this capability developed in an organization? Do the, the, uh, does the organization put the customer there? Uh, is it just an ignorant or maybe fully centered? And also here, there are instruments to capture this by an internal inquiry the customer centricity score, uh, which we also developed here in Lucerne, that can showcase in a similar level as the impact score, what sort of role the customer plays and how capable the organization is to put this customer at the center. And this is, the outcome is again, uh, reconfirming the story that we know for many years. Companies generally have a bit of a bias. Um, the employees are so much engaged in their own work that in general, companies consider themselves to be quite capable, but, uh, but not as much as the customers think they truly yeah. are. So here is this classical uh, mm -hmm. picture, which is already now a couple of years old, and our current data is reconfirming this over and over so again. True. Yeah. So the, um, the capability of organizations on putting customer center is a, is a good starting point to move on into um, what then design can add to this. Because we know emotionality is underdeveloped. There's a, the relevancy is hardly addressed. So design must play a, play a role in this. And this starts all with assigning a clear role to design activities. Major organizations deploy design, no doubt about it. I mean, everybody knows that design is important, but the way they add design skills and capability to their organization is somewhat, yeah, opportunistic, let's say that way. It's done everywhere and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's done for all the various parts. So there's, there might be a brand design activity, an industrial design activity, user experience design, work in the R&D, then there might be um, communication design and campaign activities in marketing and sales and so forth. And uh, you are lucky in, as an organization if you have access to these design capabilities, but um, some organizations don't even have them, they buy them in. And then the big question is, do all of these design activities, can they add to the organizational capabilities? And do they support the creation of a consistent and coherent customer experience? And my, my observation is not really. Uh, most of the time, as I mentioned, there's an opportunistic treatment with how to deal with design. Uh, so they're mostly add-on. Um, they're also contradicting each other. Often design principles are fighting with brand principles because simply the designers don't know each other. They never collaborated. And time-wise, they're not in sync. So there's a lot to be done in organizations to improve this because the, the outcome will, will be visible and will be felt by the customers. So also here, there has to be a new role for design, a more um, yeah, a strategic role for design, where design is treated strategically. So embracing not only formal design in the terms of you know, beautification, but it's also embracing the relational design, which is marketing, and the functional design, which is R&D. And bringing these things together under one, so to say, a design umbrella is what Dumas and Minsberg 
once called this in a, in a very important paper that they wrote, bringing this together and also giving a clear leadership role to the formal design, you build an excellent design capability in your organization. And most organizations, more biz most businesses don't have this. They still treat the formal design as an afterthought, as an add-on, and they don't build a collective, uh, let's say, view on how these three le uh, levels of design work together, the three functions of design. So this is design that counts. It's really the togetherness of R&D, marketing and sales and brand and design activities that together create what the customer is uh, perceiving. So it needs a new strategic design approach, uh, something that is over, that's binding together. I would, you could almost call this the primary activity of an organization that uh, brings these, uh, these entities together and coordinates it on a high, high level. Uh, so that's, that's what the strategic design means to me and should be implemented. To achieve this though, we have to improve one thing, and this is the design maturity in the organization. And in this case, it means the maturity of the formal design activities that take place. So the design that lead to identity creation, so it starts with brand design, and it goes through all the different touch points and basically carries the positioning that is created by identity design throughout all the various design projects that take place in an organization. Because only if, this work is mature, and only if the organization is capable in this area, it can really start to have a fruitful collaboration between marketing and R&D, uh, where also the balance is right, and where the, in the collaboration, true excellence can, uh, can emerge. So formal design, uh, the design um, that is giving shape and articulates an identity into all of the constituents of, a, of an organization, of course, also touches the user experience uh, where the design of the function is generated. It touches the customer experience uh, where all the relationship to the market and the customers and so forth is shaped. And of course, it has its key role in creating the positioning, the relevancy, the, sorry, the, the differentiation of the organization towards the wider world. Um, so formal design, of course, is not restricted only to the form giving of the, say, the outer form, of course, it's collaborating with all these different activities, and vice versa. So it, therefore, it's important that the organization is really capable to implement this activity in, a, in an excellent way. And there are many ways to describe the maturity of these activities. Uh, most of you might know the, this, uh, the Danish design ladder, which is a, is a maturity model, a step model. Actually, it's not a ladder, it's a step model where the design capability is described on these three levels. So the capability of being able to implement on a high level, uh, the capability to uh, spread the activities across the organization. So it's more like the process strength and capability. And of course, the capability to embed it on a strategic leading level uh, where it touches the brand identity setting and where it sets the directives of all the organization. And over the years, many attempts have been made to, yeah, to describe the maturity levels and also to find out what are criteria um, that we can define so that we maybe can measure the level of competency or capability in an organization. And, uh, and since that's my hobby, <laughs> creating measurement tools, this is exactly what I did over a study of many years, actually. I started with composing a so-called maturity model, which is taking the clues from, from scholars in the past, like Brigitte uh, de Mozzotta, and also the design ladder from Kotstra, the staircase model. And I kind of unified this in this sort of maturity model. And uh, that is basically the starting point of describing the capability of design in an organization. And in a study that was uh, sponsored by Miele and USM, uh, thankfully, so that we could do this, uh, I was able to uh, assess and validate 57 um, organizations in German speaking countries to create something like a score, a scoring indication of how well do organizations uh, manage design are capable in, in, in including design in their organizations. And also it was of course needed in order to generate uh, 
the, the assessment model for the capability. Yeah, this is the outcome. Again, a lot of red, very little green. Um, uh, so the in total, I have now 18 criteria that define capability level of design and organization. And they are split up over these three levels, as you can see, design strategy, design planning, and design realization. So uh, the, the, the being, the thinking, and the doing part. And then we can see that most of these criteria, which are you know, about, for instance, obtaining and ensuring resources or harmoniz harmonizing design projects across the company or positioning the, the design as a strategic um, entity, these are graded by the 70, uh, sorry, 57 companies, mostly as being underdeveloped. Uh, so the, there's actually only two criteria which were graded positively, which is the know-how of the organization to deal with design professionals and the professionalism of the design professionals involved. All the other criteria, which as you can see are mainly managerial related activities <laughs> in order to capture and ensure design are rated negatively in average. So the average is minus 20. Again, this is the same NPS scoring model that we have. And the top tier group, so those with a high score, so with the, um, this were all the companies with an average score of uh, nine and 10, um, has at least has a, a top average score of 46. And the low tier group, so those that have rated six and lower, are minus 74. So there's a substantial difference here in the scoring. And here it's interesting to see how the top groups, top performing organizations are different from low performing organizations. Whether they have a different culture, whether they maybe have different success criteria attached to them in order to start to build a correlation between design capability and organizational success. And this is what I did in the study. So I think, you know, by just reflecting the growth of the organizations, we can see that this top group, so the group with excellent and or very well developed design capabilities, consider themselves to be stable and very working very much above the market. Uh, so there's no criticism in this respect. And whereas the low companies generally already say that, yeah, we're stable or, yeah, we even have some areas below market. You know, I, I would assume that the uh, respondents have a bit of a <laughs> twisted a little bit, but there's a clear indication. Yeah, top companies see this, uh, this issue quite differently. Likewise, in the resilience that they feel. And here we are back to the issue of, you know, acting out of doubt versus acting out of trust. Top companies are predominantly optimistic. They have an optimistic outlook that very much showed also in the qualitative feedback that they gave. Uh, so three quarters are saying, yeah, you know, our future is optimistic. We think we're resilient. We can overcome struggles lying ahead of us because we're capable in, in dealing with challenges. Whereas the low company, yeah, a quarter almost sees themselves as critically positioned towards the future. So here, I think you can see in the low company, you know, the doubt might be dominating the mindset, whereas in the top company, the trust is more, you know, present and hopefully very well balanced with a doubtful um, attitude as well. So just this, this combination of, of both uh, things present. For those interested in all the details in this, um, in this study, you can download the study um, on the website of Bayern Design, German Design Support Organization. It's also available in English, by the way. Yeah, so to sum this whole thing up, the strategic design um, is recognized as something that really helps organizations to create an economic added value amongst other things. So there's a lot of questions that I've asked. And clearly, this is where all the average of all this uh, 57 organizations say, yes, you know, this will add us. But the same sample, when it comes to the design resources, clearly say that they don't see themselves having the appropriate resources it needs. So there is no capability present. Um, we are not prioritizing in the right way. So for me, uh, is this is a clear signal that there's a huge potential that has been just not enabled in organizations. Um, a huge potential which requires organizations to adopt an excellency mindset, of course. You cannot do this by just, you know, plodding along or managing your business. You really have to adopt design and strategy and employees. 
you have to also integrate all your design activities in, into one orchestrated uh, approach. And you have to start to manage your design activities, obviously, much better. You cannot leave it over to the agency or to the designer that you hire. Organizations have to develop their own capability in design or with design or for design in order to leverage that potential. Yes, yeah, so closing off, um, as I mentioned before, you get the customers you deserve. So your customers will only be as good as your organization is capable of creating an outstanding customer experience that is part of a user experience or, or surrounding a user experience and embedded in a brand experience. So it's about enabling the, the capabilities in your organizations that will create a success. Because in the end, people, us, we, all of us, we don't buy the management of a company, do we? We buy the design. Clearly, mm -hmm. that's what is delivering us the value. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think we have a, some good time left to maybe answer some questions. Exactly. Or, so we have an observation Ricardo. here from, uh, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Now we have some, Sinan is just uh, making an oh, observation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have a question for Marianne. Yeah, they will show you in a few seconds. If you want to relate to the to what uh, uh, Sinan yeah. Clara Blut is saying. Yeah, so yeah, I just reading here. Um, I don't know what's the first name, Sinem, I would assume. <laughs> I hope I pronounced it right. Yeah, so it's again the intertwingling or the, the combination. I think I would call it the collaboration because in the end, these are still different corporate functions uh, with their own methodologies and approaches and processes, most likely. But they have to be, um, they have to be, yeah, guided into a, a collaboration that has one common outcome in in view, and the outcome always has to be customer impact, because in the end, you know, you, if you if you are setting up a campaign or if you're creating a proposition portfolio or if you're adopting your pricing model, or whatever it is you do, or even from an R and D perspective, you know, if you change uh, the whatever the the technology platform of your product or, or whatever, it always comes together at the customer as a unified impact because customers do not separate. Oh, that's from the R&D department. Oh, that comes from the sales and service department. Oh, this is coming from, let's say, the brand design department. They, they perceive this together and judge the quality of what they get together. And that's also why I always say, don't start to measure the results of your organization in for silos. Adopt to have a unified measurement at the customer. And then from that, try to foster and grow collaboration. So for instance, have everybody confronting with the same um, uh, measurements. So if, for instance, if you would cust do customer impact score and you would show that to marketing, R&D and branding and all the functions at the same time and say, this is guys what we all do, then might help to sort out improved collaboration. I saw something else popping up, but it was going. Ah. Yeah, I'll show you one second. Yeah. We have a question here from Marianne. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Based on the design maturity, how one business that owns the different brands yeah. can deal with? If, again, there there are companies that are, uh, let's say, a house of brands, for instance, that you know are just a, a conglomerate, maybe with a lot of brands in them. Or FSCGs that that use brands in order that are product brands basically, or service brands. I think uh, they are they are, they are challenged in the sense that um, they for every brand for every customer facing promise that they make that is related to an identity, they have to make sure that the collaboration uh, is put in place. So of course they can they can build up a matrix organization with corporate functions where the brand is lying across. And at every you know intersection point, a brand manager, for instance, can utilize um, the the capability of an engineer or a web designer or just or a sales service um, uh, person. But again, uh, the viewpoint has to be customer centric. So um, in the end, um, a responsible brand manager, for instance, for multiple brands, has to adopt a customer centric view and has to also, in that sense have a, a clear directive towards the organization by saying 
guys, we are building a coherent and consistent customer experience. So these are the, the parameters that are, that are relevant and they have to be brand related parameters. Uh, so like corporate, like brand identity parameters that will set and define the requirements towards R and D or sales and service uh, so that they understand, okay, this is how we have to fit in our, our capability into providing this holistic experience. So it's a challenging thing, but in the end, I think it, the outcome is the same. If you're walking through an aisle and you're shopping for toothpaste and you, you remember an ad from a brand or you remember something else, and that, that again, as a customer, you have all these impact levels coming or making, making up this impact in your mind at the same time. So it, in the end, it's, the outcome is always the same. So Mike Winterstein is a great, he, he, he does a very creative work around the US and the globe. Mm -hmm. And he's a great friend as well. And he is very <laughs> similar to you. He, I think he's your, he's your, um, your twin in the US in a certain ah. way. But then we have to meet up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a very nice guy. Um, Bart is saying here about, uh, let me see here, Bart, thank you. Uh, he's just, thank you. And we Clap have a question for you. So you mentioned in the beginning about silos, and that's obvious as we have to break silos. We would like to know uh, what is your approach for breaking silos? Because everybody have a different approach. We want to hear yours. What's your, your thoughts about that? I think the only thing that can truly break a silo is a customer. Um, because in the end, you know, I mean, some organizations are truly resistant. And the, the silo culture is so strong that even a customer um, cannot break through. And those those organizations are doomed to fail and, and doomed to to be extinguished because in the end and that's what i think porter said yeah the reason to have a business is to have a customer why mm -hmm. because the customer will break through the silos so if in the discussions i also had it in phillips um, when we started to relate more and more with business groups with the different functions and there was sometimes a lot of tension you know because we had we still had different views on the customer uh, the one group thought the customer was a user, as mentioned. The other one thought the customer is just a purchaser, a consumer. Yeah. The other one thought the customer is, yeah, a, a person to relate to by building a, an identity relationship. So aligning, for instance, on how do we see the customer is very helpful. Installing sessions, talking about the customer, how everybody is relating to him or her, and then trying to align on a common view. So building a customer persona that is unified that is uh, adopted by everybody. And with that, starting not to break down the silo, but to build bridges across the silo, to build a no. connection between the silo. That's a very interesting way. Yeah, because you can, the si yeah, silos, like you, silos you will never take away. I mean, I've been now, I'm like 30 years plus in, in businesses and I don't think it will ever go away. And to be honest, I'm sitting at a university right now. I have to watch what I'm saying. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, the universities are the creators of the silos. Uh, mm -hmm. Because in our universities, we have departments. And we have uh, the business department. We have the technology department. We have the design department, sociology department. That's where it all begins. So if mm -hmm. we want to take away the silos, we have to redesign the universities. will not happen. Better yeah, is to create a process that connects everything. Yeah, Michael, Mike, that I told you before about him, he is just saying that you are brothers of the, of other brothers. <laughs> yeah. We have a question here from uh, Sema. Um, can you share a few companies that uh, fall under the top companies? Yeah. Um, of course, I cannot name them because this uh, the study was done anonymously. I know them because. For a large deal, the, the, the respondents were, were, you know, they were addressed via the National Design Institute. So the, this was just as a, not a random study. So I know uh, most of the companies and their names, but I cannot disclose them. But uh, there's one um, case, there are two cases, the company Miele and the company USM, which is known for their high yeah. quality steel furniture. furniture. Both of the companies underwent an audit, so not only an assessment, but a real audit. So I interviewed all the management team members from all the silos and consolidated a very broad view on organizational capability. And this was needed in order to understand whether the 
the model was really uh, yeah, uh, cutting cake, so to say, or uh, really working. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Miele, for instance, achieved a quite a good score, but was not yet in the top group. I think I can disclose that. Um, so it it had an excellent result in uh, in positioning work and also um, uh, yeah, you know, achieving a clear positioning with, for very much adopted by the organization. The design uh, capability uh, group was also recognized. But they had issues in efficiency, like any company, like even the top companies. Their big issue is in efficiency in design. What, what does this mean? It means that in most of these companies, the top companies as well, design is still not authorized. So the design teams often have no chance to push back on mm -hmm. decisions made. Or sometimes it's even incentivized uh, contra contraproductive because design teams are incentivized to run projects because they have project budgets. Now, I know this because I worked in Philips like this for 20 years almost. Mm -hmm. And the more budget, the better, which not always is the right decision to take. Sometimes, maybe as a design team, you should say, no, we don't do this project because it doesn't fit in our brand position. And then you lose budget. Now, if you are accountable for your budget, you don't want to lose budget. So. Even the top companies have a lot of issues built in them in the way they're organized, which is counterproductive to adopting excellency models. So we have uh, thanks here from Luis is telling you thank you. And you have a question from uh, El Elise. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have ideas on how to break silos when working B2B to see to see yeah. context where in design, maybe across uh, multiple companies? Yeah. Together, companies deliver an end user experience. Yeah, I think I, I would tend to repeat what I said before because it says to B to B to C. I mean, you can make this list endlessly. You can say B to 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 C. In the end, there will always be a customer, which will be a user, a consumer, a passenger by, or somebody that, or maybe a a citizen. You know, somebody that is at the end point or is. Let's say the, the 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 personality, the person that will enable value creation. Because up to a certain point, value creation is just adding the work of B to B to B. You know, uh, a bolt will put in the machine, the machine will put in an apparatus, the apparatus will fuel the product, the product will fuel the service, and the service in the end will be of service to somebody. So I think in in illustrating the desires, needs, and wants of that that person that is the value creator, so to say, the end user, you could call them, or the end consumer, or the end person, and use that along the value chain, also downstream, you know, up to maybe suppliers in materials. Uh, I mean, I remember from, from, from the Philips days that we once had a user persona created and we went with this whole scenario model, even to suppliers of materials, because in those days it was about more Eco degradable, eco uh, impact. It was about degradable materials. It was about stuff that you know we had to convince downstream. Uh, sorry, upstream. Wrong, the other way around. <laughs> the <laughs> suppliers of materials, uh, wrong direction. And the suppliers of materials and so forth. And by showing them, this is what the impact will be of what you will do with your material to the end 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 customer. It might convince them to adopt into it. To collaborate better so i will use the same methodology the same approach always think from a customer we have one observation here for you of a reader of your ah, book monica. <laughs> yeah yeah we have, monica. <laughs> hello yeah uh, we have a question for you to sum, to mm -hmm. start summarizing uh, how would you su uh, summarize uh, the significance and influence of design on outcomes in customer centricity in the tech companies in Europe? And what uh, areas still require attention here in Europe? And you can say about the world, but wh what's your thoughts about that? Uh, companies are not taking design as uh, you and me take and Mike take. Yeah, yeah that's a total yeah. different approach. And they don't understand that that's the core, the 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 the, the pillar of adoption and outcomes and grow, etc. So, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, 
I think we can refer back to the the pendulum that swings back and right. Uh, that that's now fully in the camp of the of the so-called. Forgive me the word, but it's a bit of a management culture. Of course, managers are not always like that, but it's dominating the manager culture, which is a a, a mindset that acts predominantly out of doubt, uh, and it's not bad. Uh, for those that really follow my story, I I, I uh, do an appeal for both to be present, not for one to be present. Now, in organizations, and this is dominating um, uh, the business and society currently, there's a domination of management thinking, of uh, of doubtful thinking, uh, which has to be counterbalanced by a more uh, free-spirited, more creative, more open, uh, exploratory thinking. Even to a certain point where I would say that even designers become tend to become more doubtful these days. You know, they are also very much fearful and not always looking into improvement and betterment. <laughs> uh, so so it, I think it's a huge challenge. And I think that's what businesses miss. I've, it, I think it shows in results. I think those organizations, it showed in my study. It also shows in other studies, also the McKinsey study, that organizations that are capable to build um, design competency are the more successful ones because they're they're able to to create better overall outcome uh, which emotionalizes on a higher level which is more relevant to customers the outcome is more relevant and most likely also the base function is more sustainable more reliable and more qualitative and i think that's, yeah. that's something that has to happen Design and simplicity is what really makes a company as a very, very successful. And there's a, a research in Seigel and Gale that I used many years ago that they showed the, the correlation of companies investing in design, investing in simplicity, and the growth of the companies compared with companies that are not doing that. That's a very interesting point. We have another yeah. observation here from, from Sema. Customer impact is outcomes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I would agree. Yeah, that's uh, that that it, the the understanding. Of what I read here: customer understand and empathetic design to deliver value. That's that's what I would call the customer centricity of an organization, uh, which is also an organizational capability. Um, and and here you can see that, uh, as I mentioned, sometimes organizations tend to be a bit more positive <laughs> towards how they see themselves. Um, um, but it, it's it's good if if you if you start to look into the mirror very very honestly. It's like with the sports person. I mean, I had a sport career in the past, and sometimes you you tell yourself, "Yeah, you can do it. You know, you can win this race." And then you end up, you know, in the bunch. <laughs> so you have to look in the mirror and ask yourself, "Okay, so what do I really need to do to be better next time round?" I'm not saying that the whole world is a competition, but just as an, an analogy. Yeah, sure. And then you have to be trust about trust to be honest about yourself and say, well, I might not be good in this, and I might not be as good as I could be in that. And then you have to train, you have to develop. And this is also something where I see a lot of organizations falling short. They are not understanding that they have to train. I mean, in the sense of practice, you know, exactly. it's like. No master falls from the sky. If you are, if you're a musician, <laughs> you spend every day hours, and then, then mm -hmm. the young CEO, CEO comes in the company and says, "Let's do this!" Ping, 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 and you ask yourself, "So where's where's the practice here?" You know, organizations also will not change from one day to the over the other by just having a new shareholder or having a new CEO. It will not it will not improve over day over day. You can see this clearly. Time. It takes time and you have to have a good trainer, a good coach in the organization, a CEO that's coaching the organization to become better as a whole. I think this is what you see in, in, in these companies that I admire in Germany. There's a company, DM, a drug chain, big drug chain company that has a coaching culture. Uh, so, yeah, we find maybe other organizations that also have that. I think that's, that's the key. Uh, so be honest about yourself. And, and, and try to have everybody adopting a culture of continuous improvement. We have more two questions, one from Mike here for you mm. and another one for us. And then we are going to start to wrap up. Okay. Maybe talk a little about putting design-friendly guide rails into AI boots. 
that people Lots. in different Lots. departments will be using opportunity challenges? Yeah, I think to me, this sounds a bit more like um, uh, on, on the systems or process level that uh, tools and methods can aid in, uh, in, in you know, uh, improving also collaboration, also across departmental work. Um, uh, because in the end, it's of course also a bit about adherency and following guidelines and, and setting and the given direction. Strategic design also means that there is a strategy and everybody has to adhere to the strategy. So um, if there are ways to improve the acceptance of directives via, for instance, smarter tools or bots or other activities that can improve the adoption of strategies, yes, I will, I'm all for it. But it starts also with, uh, again, it starts with the, uh, the culture of the people. So if, if, if they reject a strategic perspective given by somebody for a purpose, eh? saying, okay, we're uh, sheer driving pleasure. That's our objective, uh, just name one. And then somebody in the R&D department uh, has this idea, you know what? I just invent self-driving cars and the passenger can sit in the back. The, sorry, the driver can sit in the back. I kick out the steering wheel, forget all about it. Yeah, sorry, that won't work. If you're, if you're promising sheer driving pleasure, it's, it should be focused around the driver, isn't it? So that's what you, the, 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 it starts with, with having good directives and, and um, which will improve the adoption rate. And then I can imagine that these tools will also aid and help in the adoption. Yeah, yeah Michael is saying if ah, yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, I mean that's a that's a wet dream of every manager eh, to have a bot that can do things very cheaply and, <laughs> and effectively and, and also hopefully are uh, in the right way. Uh, then definitely efficiency always will be an issue. As I said, it's both, it's not either or you cannot ask for more design and and then yeah hope that uh, somebody else will give in <laughs> yeah. so yeah if, if that's uh, professor Jan, thank you so much for your time to come in here to talk with us so it's really appreciated thank I think you for having a me. great session very effective uh, how do people can find you uh, they can find me on linkedin i'm i'm pretty active there um, and my website of course which is uh, my name with uh, jan erik baars all written yeah, together i'll take that with your presentation later to post in the in the in the places so then we, yeah. can, we can share that and uh, is it right to... that you share the presentation later yes yeah if it's if it's kept among the community then it's good if because there are some pictures in there which I, I don't think I have all the rights for. So Perfect. Um, so uh, you to, have to, first to take that to avoid. I, actually, I was sued because I took a picture from somebody else. So I have to, we have to be careful about exactly. that today. All exactly. right. So, Thank you very much, everyone, for coming welcome. for the European customer experience. It was a pleasure to have you here. And you have more sessions in the early 2004, all right? And we are doing a lot of work right now to create our educational program and other things that are coming in 2004. Thank you so much. 2024, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oops. <laughs> have a lovely, have a lovely uh, week and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ricardo, for having me.